Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day today. I'm just going to give you guys a few more seconds for everybody to tune on in. All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone from around the globe to Dr. Cameron's seventh Lime Hangout. My name is Candace, and I will be leading Dr. Cameron's Q&A tonight. Um, during this Lime Hangout, if you have any questions, please feel free to write your comments below this video. Tonight's Lime Hangout discussion is titled Teen Lime. So let's get started and welcome Dr. Cameron as he's about to start tonight's Lime Hangout. Dr. Cameron. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Daniel Cameron, and uh, I'd like to tell you that um, we're still working on the Lime Hangout is um, what's the best way to present the Lime Hangout. Um, Right now, how I see it is that I've been in practice for 31 years. I've seen Lyme patients for 31 years, and uh, and I just wanted to share um, in the evening like this a uh, lot that I've learned over that time, and all of you uh, in the audience have learned. Uh, you Many of you have learned because you have uh, family or friends that have had uh, Lyme disease. So I wanted to um, begin talking about a very important topic, which is... Uh, teens that have Lyme disease or could potentially have Lyme disease. And so when I look back at the history of Lyme, uh, it really started with two uh, mothers who were concerned about their, their children who had swollen knees, they were ill, something was wrong. Uh, they were being told they had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or some kind of arthritis. Uh, mainly anti-inflammatory medicines like ibuprofen, what we call Advil now, were available. But they weren't very happy. One of them was Polly Murray, who I knew quite well. She had um, taken a number of cases and said, this isn't right. She went from neighborhood to neighborhood in the Lyme, Connecticut area and tried to find someone to say, what's wrong in this area? What's wrong with my child? And so over time, she finally um, had been um, turned away in a couple of places. Uh, then a, um, a first year fellow was identified at Yale named Dr. Alan Steer, who said, well, okay, we'll look at what you have. And together they wrote a paper uh, that uh, was published uh, in the 1970s about uh, what they called a cluster of cases. Uh, at, if I look at my book, uh, Lyme Disease Takes on Medicine, if you're looking at that, you're going to find that um, in Chapter 68, it talks about uh, that Lyme disease was first identified in a group of children and adolescents living in Lyme, Connecticut, and some young adults. So the typical patient had three reoccurrences, 16 patients had none, noted steer, who was at that time a postdoc fellow. But during remission, some patients remembered short periods of joint pain, sometimes lasting only hours without swelling. It occurred in the ankle, the wrist, temporal mandibular joint up here, the shoulder, hips, and elbows. But at the same time, because this is the rheumatologist department, there was malaise, which is uh, tiredness, fatigue, headaches, myalgias, periorbital, which is around here, edema, swelling of the hands and feet. And 12 of these subjects that they had had profound fatigue, hyperesthesias, which is abnormal, like tingling and numbness and uh, burning, sometimes persisting for months after arthritis had gone, said Steer and colleagues. So this particular group of um, adolescents and young adults Certainly when you read this, and, and if you're the first reading it for the first time, it always sounds uh, interesting that they're being told they had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. They had a lot of symptoms that were of, of concern. But um, I think if I go further in the book and look at more things that I've been talking about in the book, you really get to know more than just a clinical paper, a doctor paper, um, and you'll get to know a line much better than this, you know, because if you have a teenager who has Lyme or a tween that has Lyme, 
you'd be surprised how these various symptoms and problems can be really uh, rather frustrating to a, uh, a uh, mother or father, also frustrating to the kid. So that was in the 70s. At that time, I was at the University of Minnesota. They hadn't taught anything about Lyme disease at that time. At that time, Dr. Sear and his colleagues didn't even know that it was an infection. They just knew it was a cluster of kids and young adults who were sick with something. They weren't sure if it was an inflammatory problem, but a few of them had a tick bite. So by 1982, they discovered that that was a bacteria, special kind of bacteria, a special spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. And Dr. Burgdorferi, rather Dr. Burgdorfer, who discovered it, got name, got his name uh, uh, identified, and that's why they call it Borrelia burgdorferi. And at that point, it came up that perhaps it was an infection, that this cluster of cases in the Lyme disease area, maybe we could treat them with an antibiotic. Now, as we look at that group of, of Young, young adults and adolescents, you look back and say, hmm, is that that's rheumatology department observing it. Uh, in, um, in the, uh, later on in the, in the book, um, I'm uh, discussing in 1990, a paper by Legigian, and he included Dr. Steer, and they called it chronic neurologic Lyme. These adolescents, young adults uh, were ill for up to 14 years. And they had what we call chronic neurologic Lyme. Some people like to call it chronic Lyme, post-treatment Lyme, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. More or less, whatever name you call it, these people are sick for 14 years. And, and much of what we talk about today is based on this group of symptoms where the immune system is busy, they're fatigued, they're drained, they can't concentrate, they can't focus, uh, they have lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, joint pain, all kinds of other symptoms. And so that started the problem of if that's occurring for Lyme, what is that going to do to a child? What's that going to do to someone who's trying to go to school? The other thing that happened is that um, in, um, in, cha in chapter 78 of my book, uh, Lyme disease takes on medicine, Dr. Uh, Fallon, who's a psychiatrist that, who is now at Columbia, said that patients uh, originally were given psychiatric problems before they got diagnosed with Lyme. They were sick for an average of two years before they got diagnosed. So it's easy to read. They had paranoia, dementia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, major depression, anorexic nervosa, and obsessive compulsive uh, disorders. Uh, and, and even though that's a particular um, long list of psychiatric diagnoses, it still doesn't come home. You still can't understand it fully well until you actually have a teenager in the room and you're trying to take what you read in a book like this or what you read in the literature and what is that, what's going on to that child? What's going on with that child? And how do we take what we learn in, in, in our publications? Because remember, I told you that I'm Dr. Daniel Cameron, just in case you missed the first part of this introduction. I trained at the University of Minnesota. I went to graduate school in Minnesota all during that time, I didn't know anything about Lyme because they were just beginning to describe Lyme. I came and did residencies in, in Manhattan, at Beth Israel, and at Mount Sinai. Again, I didn't hear anything about Lyme. It's only in my 31 years in practice seeing Lyme patients that I get to know Lyme a lot better. Even when I read these stories about uh, the cluster of Lyme, even if I read these psychiatric presentations, I thought it'd be better to dig in a little deeper and see the kind of patients that I see in my practice. So in uh, chapter 126 in my book, 
I um, had a, a, a case of, um, of a seven-year-old with Lyme disease who had presented with ADHD. But the one I'm going to focus on more in Chapter 127, it's a 16-year-old with Lyme disease presenting as depression. In this case, I thought I'd go into more detail because it tells you all the details of a case very much like I might see in my practice. This was a 16 year old boy named David who was initially presumed to suffer from long standing depression. He presented with anger, frustration, insomnia, poor appetite, mild weight loss, passive suicidal ideation. So in that case, the anger, the frustration, the appetite loss, the weight loss, passive suicidal ideation, this kind of thing, you'd say, well, I'm gonna live with depression. I'll stick with antidepressants. I'll stick with therapy. If they, if they have suicidal issues, why don't uh, I admit or at least ask about suicide? His long-standing depression was exacerbated recently when he stopped dating a girl after two weeks because he felt too tired and not smart enough according to the researchers. So again, one could say, well, I might as well just send him to a psychiatrist, leave the psychiatrist and take care of it. He reported feeling spaced out all the time as if in a fog. He lived in a Lyme endemic area. So in this case, instead of stopping and saying, well, that's it, must be mood, is the the investigators went on and asked more questions. David had a steep decline in cognitive behavior, that is his concentration focus, his IQ um, was off, so they thought he was had either laziness or mild depression. He quit sports. His grades declined from A and A minus in seventh grade to nearly failing by 10th grade. He appeared lazy because he found it hard to get out of bed in the morning. He often forgot to hand in assignments that he had in fact completed. So it's again, it's easy um, to uh, grow concern. He reported trouble staying awake in class, trouble concentrating. And so they also went on further here and they described the whole range of symptoms. Now this case was uh, published in 1998. So this case I'm talking about is not much different than the kind of cases that I, I see in my practice now. So listen to this list, you know, it's very much like the list you see from the 1970s uh, that Dr. Steer talked about. It's very much like the chronic neurologic Lyme, but this is a, a, a boy. Can you imagine being in school, trying to do well in school? You dropped out of um, sports, your uh, grades have plummeted. You're thinking you wanna to go to college and the plans change big time. So here's the symptoms, severe headaches. I often find that patients have pressure here and pressure here rather than just a sharp pain. Facial fasciculations, there are muscle twitches. Now, a lot of people now are calling those tics, T-I-C-S, without the K. Myalgias, the muscle pain, stiff neck, hyperacusis. Now, this was, the sensitivity of sound. So I find that not only are a lot of my Lyme patients sensitive to, um, to uh, pain, they're also sensitive to various sensory things like too much heat, too cold, too much smells, too much uh, uh, taste, sound. They're just, um, um, they're just whole immune system is more activated. And I think now they talk about cytokines and chemokines that cause these things. There's a pair of seizures this boy had with burning, prickling sensation of his face and hands. Now, sudden sweating. Now, since this case was uh, years ago, is that now whenever you see sudden sweating, we always think of that as uh, maybe the autonomic nervous system, maybe Babesia. At that time, they weren't so clear. There were other bugs, other bacteria in a tick. Painful joints, sore throats, palpitations. Now we know that a lot of times the autonomic nervous system, which is the control over adrenaline, the fight or flight syndrome, 
when you get up too quick, move too quick, it's very easy to get lightheaded. And, uh, and it's also easy for the heart to take off um, and be uh, um, too fast. Electric shock-like pains. These are um, pains that he had that really didn't, uh, wasn't clear what the origin was. Word finding problems, like he had a hard time finishing sentences. And can you imagine that problem when you're in school? You can't even finish a sentence. Um, semantic paraphasias. Um, though I don't think it clarified too well, well what that was, but other than it's right now, we know that the cognitive problems in line is often processing information, processing what you hear, processing what you say. Short term memory problems, like you couldn't recall conversations and testicle pain. Testicle pain has been talked about for years. So the young man had had em embedded tick bites write the researchers. He could not recall ever having a rash, an erythema migrans rash. So this David's Eliza was negative in the prior three months, but his Western blot IgG had four uh, CDC specific bands, the neuropsych test, because with kids, it's so important to get them through school, important to prepare them for college that you can do like six hours neuropsych tests, find out what the severity of their uh, memory is and concentration is. So this neuropsych evaluation showed significant deficits in processing speed and visual spatial memory. So researchers um, added a SPECT scan, a nuclear scan of the brain, which had moderate to severe diffuse heterogeneous decreased perfusion of the cortex, that is the brain and the central white matter, the kind of thing you might see in encephalitis, vasculitis, or Lyme. So then David was diagnosed and treated with uh, excellent results because they had presumed he had Lyme encephalopathy. That is, his brain was not right. He was given 12 weeks of intravenous ceftriaxone. Now, right now, there's a broad range of oral antibiotics to take, but we still know that some people, some of the time, can't get better unless they do intravenous antibiotics. The brand name is called Recephin, and that kind of drug goes into the brain. Sometimes the infection seems to be in the central nervous system. I always start with pills first because so many of the people with these issues get, so many of the adolescents get better. Anyway, he improved on sleep, appetite, headaches, joint pains, numbness, distractibility, short-term memory, and emotional behavior. His depression cleared without the need for antidepressants. You always wonder if you should use antidepressants, but in this case, it turned out that um, it worked to treat with an antibiotic, and I find that's the case. If there's so many other issues beyond the, the mood, it's good to look a second time. It's good to screen for a tick-borne illness. His IQ improved by 22 points, and his school performance markedly improved. So this particular case, I thought was rather useful because it clarifies um, the issues that, that we're facing. There are so many issues right now um, where you read originally and you see there's a cluster of cases in Lyme, Connecticut. There's two mothers who uh, identified it. Dr. Steer uh, wrote about it. Dr. Fallon wrote about how um, all the psych issues, but nothing beats taking a case. Somebody who's a affected and instead of going down the psychiatric path the doctor went through the next steps and in the next steps he realized that there were a lot of other problems besides the mood and with antibiotic therapy and i'm sure there was a lot of counseling at the time because uh, uh, knowing i'm Adolescents, it's just taking an antibiotics. It's nice to work with them, try to set goals, try to get this kid back to school. In this case, because this child in, um, was 16 year old, um, so that meant that he was probably about 10th grade and uh, needed to uh, try to get control over his illness so he can get back on track to, to college. I know I have to uh, take kids on. I find that with adolescents, I include the mother and the father, even if they're split up in the discussion. I try to have the child there every step of the way because 
instead of just handing a prescription, I need to have that child work with me on, on trying to understand their disease, why their processing speed is off, why they can't uh, get the grades that they're, they're used to, um, how to work with all the emotional issues. Now, one thing that um, I often hear back on is, how do you tell a teenager from someone who has Lyme? And, and that's a challenge because a teenager can't have mood issues, concentration issues, likes to sleep, likes to sleep in late, uh, um, can have various behavioral issues. But I can tell you that there's a big difference between teenage issues. And when you do a careful history, someone has Lyme, all of those teenage issues are much more exaggerated. It's just you still have to follow each patient. The other thing I always find is that with palpitations, I often have a cardiologist involved to make sure their heart's okay. If they have pain, I get someone to help with pain. Some of them have quite a lot of pain. I get a neurologist to get involved. Some, some of them need psychiatrists, psychologists every step of the way. And it's also possible that some people have mood issues and Lyme. You can have both issues at the same time. So I wanted to um, go a little more detail in where we are now in 2018 at trying to understand what's happening to a teenager. Now, those of you who might have missed the beginning, I'm Dr. Daniel Cameron. I'm uh, holding these Lyme Hangouts uh, with you to sort of share with you and spend some time on what I've been learning in Lyme for my patients, what I've learned from reading. And um, even though I've I put them in a the book, uh, Lyme Disease Takes on Medicine. It's, um, I find it's uh, much more helpful to spend a little time pondering a chapter and discussing a chapter, getting to know it uh, pretty well. So I wanted to just sort of lay out a few more issues at the current time. One is that there's a fair amount of um, stomach issues in tweens and teens. For some reason, with everything else happening in the body, lots of them have like some nausea, kind of irritable bowel pattern. Sometimes their lower pelvis is, is a little off, but nothing really shows up with a GI workup. Some of them have a bad enough stomach that they have to have a gastroenterologist do a big workup anyway. There's a... Um, a fair amount of um, attention to what they call neuropsych issues. Neuro and psych, because it seems to be combined. So one group of investigators calls it PANS, another one calls it PANDAS. Uh, but neuropsych issues um, show up in PANS, PANDAS, and Lyme. So I think it's always important to make sure that you don't overlook Lyme disease. The PANDAS was a, an immune issue, autoimmune issues, they think was related to strep. But a lot of the PANDAS people, um, they thought, well, maybe it's a different cause. So they call it PANS. And in PANS, it's a, an acute onset neuropsych in kids. And so I just think if you hear the PANS, PANDAS, um, know that Lyme disease can push the same neuropsych issues. So. If we look back to some of the psych issues talked about in um, the 70s and 80s, is that there's different groups working on those particular issues. There's, I talked about the autonomic nervous system. There are people who go to specialists called POTS clinic, or they're, and it's called positional orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. Positional because it, as they change position, orthostatic because when they get up or change position, their heart goes faster, so tachycardic. So the first case I ever had of POTS was a Lyme case who happened to be from Africa or embedded in Africa in a missionary um, job with his, uh, with his father. And in that case, they went to a POTS clinic to try to get their blood pressure stabilized, the autonomic nervous system stabilized, but they also came to me because it, they realized that Lyme was uh, an important factor. And, and fortunately that boy is doing very well and went on to college. The, um, the irritability, the rage, the anger that was talked about in 19, uh, 
90 in the Legigian article. Well, rage and anger is certainly important if you have a child and you're sitting there in the car, you're sitting there at the family table and the, you know, there's a certain amount of irritability in kids as they get ready to um, be independent, as they get ready to go to college, if they know everything. And uh, as a father, I know some kids that know everything. Um, but still, the, the amount of irritability, in fact, because it's sort of driven by an overactive immune state, they tend to be pretty high on the anxiety scales, the depression scales, the irritability scales, OCD scales. So that's why um, often if I ask them questions on any of those areas, they often have a lot of those. They come in waves, another wave, another wave. Um, there's another thing that I thought I'd share with you, which is this change in the symptom pattern. So in young adults, they'll often wake up like roadkill, get dressed, get moving, because they have to get dressed so they can work or they can be a parent. They can feel real, relatively good for a few hours and then sink at two o'clock in the afternoon. Now that's come big swings during the day. But in adolescence, a lot of times they're not sleeping until three or four in the morning, five in the morning, even though they've turned off their electronic devices. So if they don't get to sleep till four, they work, They could wake up like roadkill. And you know how schools tend to start at like six in the morning, seven in the morning. You know, It's very hard to get a kid to make that transition, even if you get them to school. If they fade by 12, one o'clock, they can... Um, really have troubles finishing school, trouble doing homework. It's, um, so I find there's a lot of kids that find it very difficult to um, make it to school, attend school, even with tutors, they're having a hard time with tutors. If they're home uh, getting attention, they're having troubles concentrating and some kids are out for months at a time. So I like to get them into my office, get them engaged, get the family involved, get the mom and dad to understand it and try to get treatment started right away because school uh, can pass pretty quickly before the kid realizes there, there's a problem. Now, there are some kids that their psychiatric problems are so great that they have to do something with their psychiatric problems. And so they get admitted once or twice. They're, um, they're already having a lot of troubles in the school. And so it takes a while for the parent to realize that it may be more than mood. It may be that there's a take born underneath. So it's worth talking. It's worth getting a screen. Uh, I think that every kid having all kinds of troubles, uh, chronic issues, unexplained issues should get a uh, good screen for Lyme. And not just a screen where they do a blood test, not just a screen with an ELISA and, and Western blot. They should get looked at for the other infections in a tick. Uh, but the tests aren't that good. So it's, you if you're still having troubles, you should still um, get uh, out there and um, get involved with some doctor who's used to treating with uh, these complicated presentations. Uh, the, um, when one goes to um, school and works with the teachers, works with the, uh, the guidance counselors, I often find as they get better, I try to get them back to school part-time if they've been out. I try to give them a little more time to take a test because their processing is a little off. I try to help with them making sure that they, um, the whole team is aware that they uh, may have some flare-ups, that they may have problems, that they may have process issues. I help with letters to uh, try to um, explain why they might be out for a few months or a couple of years. Um, there's a wide range of troubles that teens are having with Lyme disease. So, if you look um, in my practice, um, I certainly have had an awful lot of teens uh, over the years that have done and done well. You know, I, recently I was in Washington, D.C., and I had a teen that I took care of probably 25 years ago, really sick, needed oral, needed intravenous, was out of school for an extended period of time, got better. And so uh, I ran into her uh, mother and her mother said, well, she's been well ever since. 
She went on, had two kids. Um, she has a lovely relationship. She went on to be a specialty nurse and is, at, and, uh, and is doing great. And, um, and I think that uh, whenever um, I see a teen that can find a way to get better, it's so gratifying. And so that's why I wanted to um, do a live hangout to share with you um, not just the cold, hard, scientific articles about adolescents of Lyme, but bring it to home to um, the kinds of patients that I might see. It was great that I had a case that I could kind of dig into and explain uh, uh, teen Lyme, explain uh, the challenges, but also explain the, the opportunities to treat uh, these kind of cases. So I think when I um, look at um, where the Lyme Hangout is going is that I'm um, you know, happy to have um, share uh, some things about teen Lyme. And I'm gonna be um, turning it over to Candace to, uh, to take some time to take some questions from our audience. So Candice. Okay. All right, so our first question is Igenix Lyme test. What are your thoughts on it? There are several tests that Igenix uh, Lab offers. They're at Lab in California. They um, are best known for a Western blot test. That's what I uh, find that they're that they've taken leadership on. Now, what they do is that instead of ten IgG bands, they add two additional bands. Um, IgM, they report more bands. The controversy is that the CDC said stick with the 10 IgG bands, stick with the three IgM bands. They just offer those extra bands to the doctors treating Lyme in case uh, it helps with your diagnosis. They also um, report not just the results of the five IgG band criteria, but they report the two band criteria that has been proposed. And so um, I find that that I often use like more of the local labs because the local labs are covered, the insurance covers those. And so uh, I use more clinical judgment so often that I, um, I, don't, um, uh, I don't rely so much on the test, but certainly Igenix that works hard to tr deliver a good Western blot test. Okay, and another question is, what do you do if a teen refuses treatment? Well, I find that counseling is an extremely important part of uh, my work because if I don't get the mother, the father, the teen to understand the disease, uh, oftentimes I'll focus in on the mood or focus in on sleep, the, the, the pain of, of Lyme and so I try to bring them through um, when they first get sick. What do they first get told? What do the doctors say? Because there's often more than one diagnosis the teen is aware of. The teen's heard it's depression, the teen heard it's Tourette's, it's, it's a, a sleep disorder, it's a pain disorder, or they have a, abdominal problems. So I need to, to really kind of uh, counsel the kid from the beginning get them on board, get the parents on board, work on a, on the issue of a Lyme. And, but if I just hand over a prescription uh, and uh, that's it, I often don't get the outcome I want. Well, every step of the way, I'm uh, working with that family, working with that uh, teen. Also, um, if I need other specialists, I'm busy lining up a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a GI doctors, cardiologists, anybody to work with me to help uh, get a resolution, get a good outcome. Okay, and another question is, I would like to get advice on how to help my teen daughter cope or reduce symptoms of daily dizziness, lightheadedness, which sometimes lead to her fainting, that her daily headaches have made it difficult for her to endure her daily high school classes, resulting in her missing a lot of school and a big drop in her grades. She's treated um, and is diagnosed with Lyme and Babesia. Well, that was a um, good example of the challenges that uh, 
a mother has, but it's also a good uh, example of what the child must be going through. Because for some reason, kids have a, a more sensitive um, autonomic nervous system than uh, a lots of uh, adults. They tend to be um, very easy in a tachycardic state, the heart's too, too uh, fast. Um, many of them will have a lot of lightheadedness when they get up quick. So I tell them to get up a little slower, more cautious when they get up. Um, the headache is like a head pressure, but it doesn't seem like it's quite the same as a migraine. The me medicine doesn't work so well. They often see neurologists because headaches are so bad. Neurologists try all kinds of medicines, including Topamax, ibuprofen, and don't get very far. And so in this case is that the child is trying to learn, trying to process. It's very difficult if they have such intense symptoms, whether they're at school or at home, but it's still uh, worth trying to encourage them to get their health back and get back uh, to school. Okay, another question. My 15-year-old son has Lyme disease, Bartonella, and possible Babesia. He has been doing better, not 100% better. And then he had relapse. He now has no energy, brain fog, stomach aches on a daily basis. Is this normal to be doing well and then go backwards? And what can we do to help with these symptoms? Hardly anybody with uh, complicated Lyme has a smooth recovery. It tends to be quite choppy. Uh, it's very easy to have major flare-ups. Uh, there's a word called Herxheim reaction. This is a word um, from the syphilis literature. They, they had a doctor named Dr. Um, Herxheimer who described uh, how you take an antibiotic for syphilis. There's a breakup of the bacteria. The immune system isn't happy, they get worse. So in Lyme disease, same thing happens. You take antibiotic, they get worse. So they borrowed the word Herxheimer reaction. Even if you're not changing antibiotics, you can have flare-ups that can last for hours, days, and weeks. And it's important to um, be prepared because um, it's so easy to get discouraged because when you get a flare-up, you can melt down in a few minutes. I always tell them to be very careful with simple sugars processed sweets, and alcohol, because sometimes they're starting to drink alcohol early, thinking that that's going to do something. But that simple sugars, empty calories, are not very good. If anything, the body wants it. It'll, it'll uh, feel like it needs it, but very quickly, that can easily push the, the button and they'll have a flare-up. So that's... Uh, that flare-up you're having, it's hard to tell which bacteria it is, whether it's Bartonella, Babesia, or Lyme. But when you're going through that, it's, it, it comes on so suddenly you can't tell how much is mood-driven, uh, POTS-driven, which is the autonomic nervous system, the sensory overload. But as a package, I find one-on-one -on -one work with the family or one-on-three -on -three with the whole family is uh, helpful to try to get that teen through that most difficult period. Okay. And the next question is, I'm just wondering if there's any point in taking Flagyl when other antibiotics, amoxicillin in this case, are done for a bit. There are a range of antibiotics that can be used for Lyme disease. So doxycycline can typically be used after the age of eight, around that time. Zithromax, which is a uh, generic name is called azithromycin, is useful. So all of those are useful for Lyme disease. For ehrlichia and anaplasmosis, I like to use uh, doxycycline or doxycycline family, which includes medicine. I sometimes have to use rifampin for that situation. Babesia is a parasite that you can't get better unless you use a parasite medicine, like Mepron or Malaro, M-A-L-A-R-O-N-E. Those are um, brand names for atrobiquone. And the flagellate question comes up because in a test tube in Eva Sapi's lab, they thought that helps fight Lyme in a test tube. 
So the question is, does it help Lyme or tick-borne in people? So some people try a flagell. I like flagell sometimes if I can't get mepron or malaron. Also, flagell is a anti-parasite medicine. So if it would be easy as a parasite, you know, I don't have enough literature to go on, but sometimes uh, in my most difficult patients, I might use flagell. So yes, do I use flagell, but not as my first or second line treatment. Okay. The next question is, a 17-year-old daughter's symptoms started in November, says she feels about 60% better, but still struggles with daily headaches. Has Lyme Babesia Bartonella, did a month of doxy two, row, two weeks of melarone, neither made her feel better, then went herbal route. Would, would love to find something to stop the headaches. I find that the counseling antibiotics is, and staying away from sugar and alcohol and those things are quite helpful. Um, in, um, in this case is that usually if four weeks of doxycycline and two weeks of um, Mepron was prescribed, there might be value on staying longer, trying a different antibiotic. Once in a while, somebody needs intravenous antibiotics. I use intravenous uh, ceftriaxone for Lyme disease. Herbal medicines, alternative medicines, that's a, a broad field. I, I find that I spend so much time on counseling, diet, and antibiotics that I lean on this, those uh, professionals who work with herbal medicines to see if they can offer something to help those difficult patients. Okay. My 17-year-old daughter is BB positive and EBV, Epstein-Barr positive. She has severe chronic fatigue insomnia recommendations. It can be very difficult to tell the difference between chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and Lyme. They look very similar. In this case, the Epstein-Barr test, which is the antibodies against the mono, they can be high. They can, it can say right on a sheet of paper, they're acutely reactive, they're uh, reactivated. It's uh, not always so clear because... Um, there's been some research uh, calling it chronic fatigue instead of Epstein-Barr syndrome because it's even though the number is high, there's still some debate in medicine as to is the fatigue driven by Epstein-Barr or cytomegalovirus, which is another virus that's similar to mono. Um, so I think that there's still uh, some questions raised. I don't like to drop everything else and focus only on Epstein-Barr because uh, it, you miss the opportunity to look for a more treatable cause. All right, next question is, um, I was just, I was assigned flagell the other day, but I am finishing antibiotics tomorrow. Is there any point in taking flagell without the antibiotic or could you just generally talk about how flagell works? Well, flagell was introduced um, in the test tube. And so they were able to, to grow some spirochetes in a test tube. They were able to see that the spirochetes weren't very happy if you stress those spirochetes. They added flagell. They added, in another study, stevia. And they're trying to see if they can do something to a spirochete in the lab. Now, whether the flagell works that way when you swallow a pill some doctors think it does. So I, I still think that there's, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for a little more research to find out actually what happens when you take flagell. I, I use flagell more, as I mentioned earlier, for its role as the treatment for parasites. So we're observing things as doctors on the most difficult patients where there's no clinical trial, no double blind, randomized trial that can answer those questions. So flagell falls in that category of personalized medicine where we don't have a nice trial to give us the right answer. And yet some of our patients, some of the time, can't get better with the standard treatment. Okay, 
Another question is, our 16-year-old son has been in treatment with pulse antibiotics for two and a half years for four traumatic brain injuries. He is now with no symptoms and will be in maintenance mode in two months. He still has slightly positive mycoplasma tests, but is asymptomatic. How often do you see teen Lyme patients relapse after they are feeling 100% better? He will pulse three weeks off and one week on for six months before completely quitting that part of treatment. Well, there's, there's different schedules for how to treat Lyme patients or tick-borne patients. I tend to treat daily and make adjustments on, on the basis of the outcome. Some of my colleagues like pulse therapy, which means they start some treatment, they stop, they start, they stop on a regular basis. Um, there's a good outcomes um, that have been reported, but I tend to find I do well enough with daily therapy. I monitor it um, carefully. They do so well with that. I, I also get concerned because pulse therapy is still relatively uh, more of a proposal. And um, I always have uh, caution on that area. But the good news is that uh, the team did well. You know, the extended therapy, you know, even though it was used in a pulse therapy format, worked. And uh, in terms of relapse, it's, um, I think the longer one is well, the less likely you'll get a relapse. So I try to make sure that I get a good outcome and, uh, and, and get uh, everything under control before I back off of antibiotics in, in these tough cases. Okay. My 19 year old daughter is a college freshman at, at Connecticut College and is struggling with severe brain fog and concentration. She has asked the medical, um, the medical doctor on campus said that um, she's experiencing placebo effect. He said there's no such thing as chronic Lyme and that she and that since some doctor told her she has Lyme, this is why she believes it. She's very frustrated and is wondering if the campus doctor is correct. He doesn't believe Igenix test is valid, so she is confused. Is this common problem that you come across? And how can this Connecticut doctor not believe in chronic Lyme? Well, doctors are divided on, on this topic. Often it's uh, semantics. Some people like to use a different term so they say they don't believe in chronic Lyme means they don't believe in chronic Lyme word. Some of them like the word post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome because it implies that the infection is gone. So if one looks at what's published, it's clear that Lyme disease is a problem even in the 70s when they first described Lyme. Some of those were chronic. Some of those knee problems were chronic. Some of the kids were chronic. Dr. Fallon described a lot of psychiatric problems for at least two years. Every NIH trial, all four showed chronic issues. Now, there are, but there are still doctors, despite what's published, despite patients that they see in their practice, despite uh, um, all the knowledge that's out there, still don't like the word chronic Lyme disease, or they just have come to the position that there is no chronic issues from Lyme. But I think that, uh, you know, doctors are, are not changing sometimes. They just sort of stay with that position. And sometimes you're not going to change it yourself. Your daughter may have to uh, at least get a second opinion. The first opinion was it doesn't exist. But a second opinion, look at somebody else who is at least familiar and comfortable with the complications of Lyme, the manifestations of Lyme on a chronic basis. And uh, it's important because if you're in college, you want to be processing right, you want to have the energy, you don't want to have be fatigued, don't have, want to have sleep issues. And so, um, you know, you just uh, have to be aware it's, uh, that some doctors have very strong opinions that it doesn't exist, no matter where the literature is. Okay, another question. My son got infected with Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia when he was in the seventh grade. He's now 30 and suffers from all symptoms you described. Fatigue problems, concentrating, disabling, anxiety, depression, and so many other things. He's only been in treatment for the past two years. At this point, is the neurological damage permanent and 
will he always have these mental health symptoms? Well, the, the NIH trials, the National Institute of Health trials, touched on this very topic is, can we in a formal trial get people who've been sick for two years better? They were enrolling people in, in one trial that were sick for nearly five years, another trial, nine years. And it does become more difficult to treat people the longer they're sick. So that's why I urge teens to not put things off, not wait nine years. If you're 16, don't wait till you're 24 to get treated. And, and this whole question of placebo is that some people with counseling, with the right diet, with everything that's done during a trial has some value, even without the antibiotics. And so it's a, it gets rather difficult in a complex illness that's been going on for years, like in this case, two years, to see, is there something you can do to get your baby better? Um, you know, I'm always um, finding that the, it challenging when someone's been treated and done well, is there some, uh, is there an opportunity to get further? Can I do better than that? Is And so some people stay ill, but I'm a fighter. I'm gonna be in there working on looking for an opportunity to find a way to get that person better. Okay. What kind of tick-borne illness research is going on? Somebody's asking that question. Right now, there are there are no um, serious trials of treatment in the United States. There, um, there's one trial in uh, in the Netherlands where they were treating with two weeks of intravenous, or they did two weeks of intravenous with uh, about three months of oral. The problem they found is that neither group did very well. So I find that trials are complicated because you can't individualize therapy. You can't individualize therapy as to what that person has. You know, Not everybody has Lyme. Some of them have Babesia, some have Ehrlichia, some have Anaposmosis. And there's new uh, species like Borrelia miyamotai out there. In the United States, the biggest trial right now is not treatment. Uh, Hopkins, Johns Hopkins had a study recently where they only gave three weeks of doxycycline for a rash and maybe two thirds did well, but one third either had pain, fatigue, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And that's really not a treatment study. It's an observation study where they agree, they signed a paper saying, I'm not going to get treated anymore. I'm just going to be followed. And the results um, for the third who are doing poorly are not good. And I, I'd rather have a treatment trial. Take those who are well, leave them alone. Those who are doing poorly, uh, come up with a better treatment regimen and come up with a more responsive treatment regimen, treat them earlier, and... Uh, and work on some better outcomes. Okay. My 19 has, I don't know if it's a daughter or son, um, has been battling Lyme since 2014. He does not metabolize medications probably, properly. He has most of his symptoms you have talked about. He's doing IVIG weekly, still does not feel any better and continues to worsen. What can we do to help him? It's clear from the questions that um, I have a very educated, articulate audience out there who knows Lyme well. Part of they know well because their teenage son or daughter has been through it. They're facing the same challenges. So I'm, I just want to do a shout out for uh, my audience as to the kind of character of the questions that they're asking. So when I was talking about pandas and pans, that's a, a groups of doctors who have been seeing neuropsychiatric issues in kids. They often say, look for ticks, look for Tourette's, uh, look for OCD. Their assumption is that the biggest issue is immune. 
So they give IVIG, which is intravenous immune globulins. Those same doctors, some of them have said, well, antibiotics seem to also work. Not just antibiotics for strep, sometimes antibiotics for Lyme work. So if I see IVIG, I always ask the question, have they been looked at for a tick-borne illness? But there are some children that benefit from IVIG. There's some adults with some nerve issues that benefit from IVIG. So I am happy that they're pursuing IVIG. They're studying IVIG. Neurologists are the ones that are doing it. Sometimes allergists are doing IVIG. And so I'm out there waiting to see uh, what their results are. But sometimes it does help. And that's all for tonight. That's all our questions. Well, I, I appreciate um, so much having the opportunity to talk about one of the, my favorite parts of Lyme, which is to um, take someone who um, has a child or take a child who comes in and uh, and how do you like take it on, work with them, counsel with them and treat them. And so I um, appreciate having the opportunity to spend time with you this evening. I appreciate the, having Candace there to um, introduce uh, me and to uh, organize a, an outstanding Q&A session. So here, here you go, Candace. All right, everybody. Hope everyone had and enjoyed this wonderful session tonight. Just wanted to let you guys know and remind um, newcomers this session that on um, their Dr. Cameron's having a book signing event. It was originally scheduled for May 26th. If you're following him on Facebook, the flyer's already up with RSVP um, information. Um, the date is actually now changed to June 9th. So it's no longer May 26th. It's going to be June 9th, same time, 4.30. Um, same location, Mount Kisco, New York. So if you guys are living or residing in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, or if you're coming into town, into New York to visit, please come on by um, that day. Um, we'll be having refreshments, um, um, snacks. We'll also be having some guest speakers speak um, about their testimonials with Lyme. Dr. Cameron will also be doing a live feed that night, and he'll also be discussing a topic from his book. And um, what else am I missing? He's also, um, that night also too, he was, he's also gonna be selling his books um, there as well at the event. So if you have not purchased your, um, his book, which is this beautiful thing, um, it is available um, at his office. So if you guys would like to purchase um, his book, um, you can um, send an email to Dr. Daniel Cameron events and we'll send that book um, out to you. Or you can um, order online where the, he also has ebook if you'd like to listen to it in the car or if you just wanna um, order it right now and get it. If you have Amazon Prime or anything, you can get it within two days, two to three days, I think. And, um, also, if you're not following his um, YouTube channel, um, please follow and subscribe. It's at Dr. Daniel Cameron. So any um, past Lime Hangouts is um, up and it's on there so you can watch and tune in on there. Um, you can also follow him, on, follow him on Facebook, Daniel Cameron MD, Instagram, Dr. Daniel Cameron. He also posts on Instagram on a daily basis. So you'll see... If you have questions or comments or anything of that sort, you can um, follow him on Facebook and Instagram and ask him those questions. Also, if we did not get to answer your questions tonight, um, he will um, answer them within this coming week. So um, please tune in and just keep checking back up on that and he will answer your questions. And um, for the event, if you have not RSVP'd, please go on Facebook and RSVP there. Um, and that's about it. So tune in next time, May 8th, same place, same time. See you then. You guys have a good rest of your evening. Until next time. Bye-bye.